Welcome to Royalwood Church, and thank you for joining us online. If this ministry has impacted your life in any way, please share your testimony by sending us an email at media at royalwood.cc. We would love to hear about your experience. If you would like to give to the church financially, you can do so online at royalwood.cc. Simply click on the Give tab. Once again, thank you for joining us online. Please open your heart to receive a word from God today. Exodus 15, I'm going to read verse 1. And then I'm going to jump down to verse 23 and verse number 24. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. And spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider hath he thrown into the sea. And then in verse number 23, going to the bitter waters of Merah, and when they came to Mara or Merah, they could not drink of the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Merah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And I'm just going to talk to you for a little while today on this thought after praise. In other words, what happens after praise? There's something that has gone on here. This is a uh, an example, a glorious example of praise. That whole 15th chapter leading up to verse 23 and 24 is just this praise celebration and this, as the new term is, this praise break that Israel's having. But I want to talk about after the praise. And everybody say, in Jesus' name. Everybody say, Lord, bless your word. You may be seated. You do all look good. I don't know if you feel good or not, but if you don't, you are faking it very well. Thank you for doing that. Not being a faker, I'm talking about just uh, looking like you're all right. You know, sometimes the enemy who doesn't know everything kind of looks at your demeanor to see how much he wants to put on you or attack you if you're in a low moment, he'll just attack you a little bit more. But if you've just got this smile on your face, and this it's confusion to the enemy. I, I think our demeanor is so important. This is not my message, but and, and I know with some of you, the more you know, the more I try to talk to you about this demeanor you get. But I I want you to listen to what I'm saying today. That. That, that, that has a lot to do with your success in living for the Lord. And that's not being the power of positive thinking or anything else. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, when you get down in the dumps and you start saying things that this is about the end or I'm about through or I'm fed up and you start saying all those things and the enemy picks up on that, then that's the time to launch an attack on you. But whenever you go through something and say, well, I'm hitting this, but God's going to help me out of this, you activate faith. And things began to happen. That's not my message today. I just felt like I had to share that with you. You're looking good today. Be careful with praise. There's just something about praise that can be as awesome as it is, as wonderful as it is. It, it, there's a danger to it. Praise can put you in a state where uh, you think things are better than they are. Like you come in here, and man, we get to praise and the music sounds good and everybody's worshiping. You get in it, you, you're clapping your hands or some of you are getting in it and some of you are clapping your hands and, and, and you're enjoying the presence of the Lord and, and it's like, man, I don't have a care to my name. Everything's great. Uh, things are wonderful. And then Monday you can encounter something and it just take away everything that happened during the celebration in praise. And that's not an uncommon thing. I had to go all the way back to the Old Testament to get back to where I could bring this to you. Plenty of uh, references of this all throughout the Bible, but I want to go all the way back to where Israel had this issue with something going on after their praise and after the celebration of what God has done. It's possible to reach a, a place of depression uh, when, when praise is concluded. God did it. I worship the Lord for it. I told everybody the Lord's been good. And now all of a sudden I'm in a low place and I'm in a valley and I just don't know how to get out of that and I don't understand because I felt so good back there a few days ago. 
Because despite the best efforts of me as your pastor, the church is not always living in the sunshine. I, I wish we could have everybody all up on top at the same time. Now, if that happened, it'd be heaven. We'd have to go on. But uh, I wish we had everybody up at the same time. Brother Harold, my dear, dear friend in Bridge City, uh, I asked him one time, this has probably been 25 years ago, uh, I, I was so frustrated because well, I, I would get some message and God had spoken to me and, and I'm going to go into that little building over there and I'm going to preach this message and brother, this thing is going to be straightened out. Everybody's going to be lined up. Everybody's going to be on top. Everybody's going to be ready. God's given me this. This is God's word and I'm ready for this to happen. And so I'd get up there and preach that message and, and we'd have good, it would be good. Things would be good. Somebody would come up to me after the service and said, I just don't think I can come back to church anymore. And that was the message that was supposed to lift everybody up. That was the answer to everybody's dilemma. And, and, and now it, uh, it, it didn't work. So what happened? I was talking to Brother Harold about it. I said, uh, what, what's your attitude when you come to church and, and you're going to preach to the people? And he said, well, son, well, no, first of all, he, he paused for about two minutes. And on the phone, two minutes is like two days for me. So uh, if, if you're on your, of course, I, I don't think we were on the wireless because I don't think we had, uh, we may have had a transportable phone back then, I don't remember. But uh, he just sitting there, too, you know, just breathing. And, and then finally he says, well, my my attitude is I just go in there to try to get a few more lifted up. Now, it doesn't sound profound to you. It, it, that doesn't sound like, you, that's not a wow moment. But that is the epitome of profundity. I mean, it, it's like, that's what you got to do. Because everybody's not going to get up at the same time. But what do you do? You're just going to try to get a few more lifted up. Because somebody's going to encounter something on Monday and they're going to come back the next service and you're going to need to lift them up. Sometimes when it comes to, to devils, I, I told somebody that uh, here a while back, I said, I was with my kids uh, long ago and, and uh, there was this thing they had at, at Baytown Mall. I can't even remember the name of this, this, this place, but it was this uh, place where you go and play the games. It was out in the middle of this, uh, this big Mall is a big ball at the time, if you can imagine that. That's where we always went, took the kids. And they had these games. Brittany was just a little bitty, and I would help her with this game where they had the, these little gophers that would pop up out of this uh, little uh, game, and you had this rubber mallet, and you would hit one of them. And then another one would pop up, and, you'd hit, and if you could hit them, then you scored by hitting those those things. And, and she wasn't very very fast. I was behind her, and she, every now and then she'd see one. It would pop up. It'd be 1,001, 1,002, boom. Oh, no, you missed him. Okay, there's another one. So, you know, I tried to help her because you got tickets. You all remember this. You probably even know this. If you don't don't know about this, I'm going to enlighten you on something. So, so this is going to be profound here. So I got behind her, and when they would come up, Daddy got them. That's how I did it. Or they, she was hitting me, hitting, hitting, you know, and, but hey, that didn't work. And those tickets were coming out. And, and so we would be able to take them. You, you know, it takes 3,000 tickets to get a whistle. I, I'm just telling you that. $20. But we were doing it because that, everybody went back, had to go, go, go take care of that. And I just thought, you know, fighting the enemy and all that is just like that game right there. You think you got it when you hit him. One good lick, and, but then there's another one pop up. Now, you can get all frustrated and just say, I quit, or you can say, I'm built for this. God has designed me to have victory, and I will have it. I may not have ultimate victory until heaven, but I'm going to have victory today, and if I have a trial next week, I'll have victory there. I'm going to have victory. And so I, I worry about people, dis, d, despite of how, how, how much I've tried, in spite of how much I've tried to lift them up and, and pull people up, uh, they still go through things, and the church doesn't live every moment in the sunshine, uh, sunshine. You know, there are times things don't go well. Th th this idea of, of living in, in this fantasy world, uh, you know, I was reading this in the paper the other day. Uh, 
Pokemon. I don't know. Uh, I don't know anything about it. I just was reading it. It's a game. People are playing it, and people are are, are going out in front of cars. They're going, you know, all this trying to find these virtual uh, figures or whatever. When I first heard the the, the news guy on the radio uh, was talking about Pokemon, I, I just thought this has got to be a Bob Marley thing. Y'all, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have brought up something y'all wouldn't know anything about. Uh, Bob Marley was kind of a reggae singer and everything was mon. So I, I, that's the first thing I thought of. I thought, my goodness, what is all of that? Pokemon? I, I don't understand how that works. I, I, it, it just, it just I, I didn't understand it. And this is the thought that I, I, didn't, I don't know how all of that works when, when it comes to finding all that in virtual reality. But this is what, what, what really dawned on me. This world is more wrapped up in things that don't even exist than being concerned about the things that are real things, real realities of life. Let me tell you, we're in a battlefield. We're not in the rec room. We're not in a time of fun. This is a battle to the very end. But don't get depressed and despondent and feel like you can't do anything. God's going to give you victory if you will hold to his unchanging hand. We have funerals. We lose loved ones. We have people that are killed by uh, extremists. Uh, the list goes on and on. It's not always perfect. We lose those dear to us and near to us. Things are not what you want them to be. It's not the way you planned it out. The proclamation, but let me, let, let, let me say this to you now. What happened to Israel is they got so excited when the Lord brought the victory that they got a few verses down. As a matter of fact, it was about 20 verses down, 22 verses down, and they come to Merah and they can't drink the water. And the first thing that happens is they lose every bit of the praise that they had over there in the first verse. They're all excited about what God's done there. This was the answer. Get rid of the Egyptians. Get rid of Pharaoh. This is going to be unbelievable. God's done this. He'll do anything. God will take us all the way to the promised land until you meet the bitter waters. And that changed everything. Exodus, the 15th chapter, is just this incredible account of praise. Israel had a reason to praise. Some people don't know what that is, where you get the reason to praise. What, what they were singing about on this clean uh, song today, that gives you a reason to praise. You're clean today. You don't have to go back and, and endure that anymore. This has been taken off your record. When you pray, the Lord doesn't even remember what you've done in the past. It's been expunged from your record. Some of you uh, former convicts know what I'm talking about when I say that. It's been taken off your record. Nobody can pull it up. They do a search on you, and that yet sin is not even mentioned anymore. You're clean. That's grounds to get your shoes laced up. Get ready to praise God because that's something to praise the Lord for. I'm clean. Israel had a reason to praise. When Israel considered their present position uh, in, in relationship to the, the prior plight that they had, they could not help but be caught up in ecstatic, joyful praise. They were so excited when they considered the victory they had and they considered 400 years of slavery, they could not help themselves. It was so glorious. Exodus 1 and 8 said, There arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And because of that, they were placed into slavery. 400 years, the taskmasters made their lives miserable killed their children beat them they worked slave labor from that moment forward 400 years it went on and then Moses is born God's got a plan to get them out it seems like it's taken so long God will never get it done but a baby in the bull rushes is fixing to deliver them from where they are God arranged on the Nile River a cross country, a cross culture, 
uh, interracial adoption of a, a little Israelite boy with an adoption from an Egyptian woman brought into his house. This, this, this child that they were trying to kill, God figures out a way to spare his life he ends up in Pharaoh's house. He's eating Pharaoh's food. He's wearing Pharaoh's clothes. He's being taught by the finest teachers. And now after 400 years, the fruition of all of that, it's now uh, taken place. God's brought them out. God's brought them through. The prayers that we prayed for 400 years have been answered. Now we see the Egyptians have been drowned into the sea. That's something to be thankful for. They have lived for that moment. If you read Exodus the 15th chapter, verse number one, I read that to you, but verse four says, Pharaoh's chariots and his host have been cast into the sea. Oh, what a thing that was. And then in verse number eight, it said, and with, and with the blast of thy nostrils, talking about God, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. In other words, this is how we marched across. And in verse number 10, thou didst blow with thy wind and the sea covered them up. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Whoa, man, you get excited about that when that comes to your enemies. Yes, sir, man, they sank like a rock. God got ready and that was the end of it and everything's going to be great. Then in verse 19, for the horse of Pharaoh went in and his chariots went in, his horsemen into the sea and the Lord brought again the waters upon them and the Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. Oh, this was so wonderful. And the Bible said they really hardly didn't even believe it until the Egyptians began to float up onto the shore. My goodness, wasn't that something? All of a sudden you think it's, your troubles are still there and all of a sudden they come body surfing right up on the beach. Boom. Of course, if it was in our day and time, they would think it was some kind of whale that needed to be rescued. They'd go over there and try to resuscitate them, swim out there with them. They were gone. They sank like lead because it was intended that God would take care of those enemies of God's people. This was the thing that made them celebrate. This was the thing that made them excited. They shouted about it. They rejoiced about it. Moses said it, and then Miriam picked it up. She got excited about it. In verse number uh, 20 of chapter 15, all the women went out after her with timbrels and with, with dances, and they began to celebrate what God's done. They've got tambourines. They've got uh, musical instruments that they're playing with their hands, and the clinking and the, and the clattering of sound, that it, it's the most exciting thing. They are arm in arm. They are dancing. They are celebrating what God has done for them. Everybody is getting in on it. Two-thirds of the chapter is taken up with telling what God has done. The people are praising. The people are excited. Oh, let me tell you, it is so exciting to see it until they get to the bitter waters. This is the after praise I want to talk about. This is what happens after the celebration. You know, there are people that when they have God do something for them they get all excited and all of a sudden you see them run by you you know it's like well what's going on with you did you hear about it they got the good report on their test and and, and everything's going to be all right and they're shouting somebody else dancing did you hear about it they got the best job they've ever had or somebody else has got something else going on uh, in, in their life and man they're just celebrating and I know there are times around churches you got people that are always looking through the years and all these years that I've pastored people, we, we've had all kinds. We've had fruit inspectors, people that would inspect other people's fruit to see if they really were of the fruit of the Spirit. We also had people, they always had the, the, the stick that, that checks the oil because they're going to check everybody's oil in their vessel to see if it's really the Holy Ghost oil. I, I've called them dipsticks since then, but I, they, they, they're checking things out. They're always worried about, does that one have it? Or do they really, is that really from the Lord? Or, or would somebody gets the Holy Ghost, they got to say, well, uh, did they get the real Holy Ghost? Well, I don't know any other kind of Holy Ghost. I mean, either it's the Holy Ghost or it's not the Holy Ghost. But if they got the Holy Ghost with the evidence speaking with tongues, they got the real Holy Ghost. You know what? When we have people pray through, like a big bunch of people pray through, we have 15, 20 people pray through, baptized 30 in one service. Do you know that there are naysayers that are about that say, I just wonder what they really got? Because they feel like people have got to work their way through a six months probation period before they ever get worthy enough to get to the altar where they can get cleaned up. 
feel like that they've got to go through certain steps before they can ever get to the place where they're worthy to be prayed for by the pitiful saints. That Listen to me. If that's the case, the world will never be reached. We'll never be able to save anybody. Whosoever will, come on. However you are, come on. Listen, you don't have to go through a bunch of steps. Get a hold of God and he will advance you in the kingdom in a mighty way. Oh, now they're at Merah. This is bitter waters now. You know, when you have these things happen, when God does things for, uh, to you, you know, when you watch me worship, I, I hope I worship the same way every day. And, and some days it's really good and some days it's really bad. But I want the enemy to think it's really good every day because God's good all the time. That doesn't mean my circumstances are good all the time. Well, you know, that sister got all excited, and I, I don't know if that was really uh, the Holy Ghost dance or, or, or not. We had a guy one time that came to our church. He was an old country western guy, and he got the Holy Ghost. And I, I'm going to tell you, when he, got, when he started shouting, uh, I, he was not doing the normal Pentecostal dance. Whatever he had been doing, the Saturday night before at the OK Corral. That's what he did when he got the Holy Ghost. But we had some people that were watching him. And I could tell, one of our ladies, I, I could just tell, she needed to school him on the proper way to dance before the Lord. You can't cotton-eye Joe to Jesus. You know, you can't just do that to Jesus now I mean you we, I got to show you how to do it you know I got now watch me you know I mean that's the way it was she she stopped him finally and started telling him about uh, <laughs> words in the Bible that had to do with praise it's not funny uh, it was it's funny now but it wasn't funny back, back then because I wanted to choke her because <laughs> Yeah, because she started off by saying, have you ever, do you know what the word hallelujah means? No, I don't. She said, you know, it's hallelujah in every language. She started going through this thing. Somebody get me a hammer. You know, he's been saying hallelujah. He don't have to know the definition of hallelujah. But you don't have to explain to him all the particulars about what steps to take when, when you get the Holy Ghost. Well, Pastor, uh, you know, I don't really think it, it, it takes all. It, it really doesn't take all of that. But when you realize what God has done for you, it takes all that. When you realize that all your family's in church, it takes all of that. When you realize your boys come home, it takes all that. When you realize you were lost but now you're found, it takes all that. Pardon me while I worship God. Pardon me while I praise him with abandon. Pray. Pardon me while I give him the praise that is due him. When she got through with him, I went over and sat down by him and said, how do you feel? He said, wow, I've never had anything like this. He said, man, this is awesome. I said, you know, everybody's trying to help you and I said, you know the lady just talked to you? He said, yeah. I said, forget everything she said. Just do what you were doing. Just, I mean, that's all you got. That's all you know to do. Just, just do that. We're not going to be offended at that. We're not going to be offended if every now and then when the Lord moves on you, you holler yeehaw. We're not going to be worried about that. We're not going to worry about that situation. Just do what you feel like doing. He's been in the bars. He's been living in sin. All of a sudden, he's clean by the blood of the Lamb. I'm going to do what I know to do. I've danced all night in the night club. I'm going to dance all night for my king. I'm going to dance before the Lord with all my might. Let me tell you, church of the living God, the redeemed needs to say so. The redeemed needs to say so. Woo. I don't have enough time to tell you folks all the things I want to tell you today. You know what, the other day, uh, the message I preached, uh, I can't even remember, I think it was last Sunday, on Keep the Change. Uh, 
it, 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 it was on, I, I think it was YouTube or Facebook. I, I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember what social, I don't know how to distinguish, distinguish between all the social media. I, my, it's like my mom and dad, they'll say, we saw it on the internet. Yeah, that's the means of the method, but where was it on the, you know. They'll say, you can find it's on the internet. Oh, okay, well, all right. They mean like Facebook or, or, or whatever it is. I don't think they have Facebook, but whatever it would be. And, and, and so uh, the lady at, at, at my dentist, Sharon, Cersei, preached her dad's funeral, preached her mother's funeral. They've been, she's been here several times. Uh, I walk in the other day, uh, and, and even though I'm going to the dentist, I'm still happy. And uh, she said, Pastor, I was just telling my coworker here to listen to your message from the other day. Keep the chair. And I said, oh, well, that's, that's, that's nice. And she said, we've already listened to some of it here. And she said, it's amazing. She said, Pastor, I've shared that with everybody. She said, I, I, just, I just want you to know that, that, that that's what we needed to hear. She said, I love, and when I finally got out of the chair and, you know, uh, escaped and got in my car, this was the thought that came to me. What would happen to our world, I'm talking about our, our world here, everybody that's within our world, if we had that same exuberance? If we shared those kinds of things and the good news, like a person who is not even a member of the church, what could happen to your world around you? If we worried more about that, the good news, than we did about the bad news, there would be a greater blessing that would come upon people and what an opportunity it would be to do something for God. Now, it was awesome that they had had that miracle and that Miriam decided to dance. Now, I know that would have been a real big deal if that would have happened at church because woman with tambourine, then all the other ladies get tambourines and they're all dancing. First of all, we'd have to know uh, what kind of dancing it was and, 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 you know, were they in the spirit? You know, we'd have to discern all that. Uh, I, I say we would. I'm just talking about people would feel like they would need to. Uh, I've got. Was that in the spirit when she came by? I don't. Was that brother ran by? Was that in the spirit? No. I, I will tell you. If they come by you and they run by you, they're in the flesh. Because that's all they've got to run by you in. And when they're dancing, they're dancing in the. Some of you, I'm giving you some revelation here. You better buckle this up. Some of you, you you're going to put it in there and tonight. Today, you're going to be talking on the way home. Do you really think that when I shout, I'm in the flesh? Yeah, because that's all you've got to shout in. I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to make you feel bad at all. You're telling people, well, I dance that night. If we start having people dancing in, in spirits, I'm out of here. That's why it said dance, David danced before the Lord with all his might. Because when you get the news and when you know who he, what he's done, you don't have to be prompted. That's why some people don't ever move forward. It's because they're waiting on angels to get them by the elbow and drag them along while they're making tracks in the carpet. And they say, now, now I guess I have to. They've got me now. But what you can do when you get to thinking about what he's done, how good he's been to you, what all he has answered for you, you can praise him. You don't need anybody to pick you up and do something for you. Now you would worry about Miriam's in the church, but I don't ever worry about strange fire. That's kind of an old term. Nothing wrong with it. I used to hear it all the time. I feel like he had strange fire. I've never worried about strange fire. That's never been a part of the things I've ever worried about as a pastor. There cannot be much strange fire with as many wet blankets that are around a church. Just can't be. Always somebody there say, put that out. Got to make sure. But here's what happened to Israel. You get after the praise. You feel like it's going to be smooth sailing and then you meet the bitter waters. What do you do now? They start complaining. The proclamation of your victories should occur in the presence of your defeats. The proclamation of your victories should be made 
in the presence of your defeats. You come to that and you feel like you've lost. That's when you need to stand up and say, my God has come through and he's not deserting me now. While you're on that low limb, reach to the high limb and say, God's going to do it. I'm so surprised at the contrast in Exodus 15 through 1 through 21 between that and verse 22 and verse 24. I'm shocked at it because those, those first verses, it's God's doing it, he's doing it. The horse and the rider thrown into the sea. Come on, somebody shout with me, somebody worship with me. And now we're at the place where we cannot drink the water. It's bitter. First 21 verses, Israel is shouting. The next, 20, uh, the next few verses, they're murmuring because they were thirsty and they couldn't get what they wanted. Kind of sounds like church folks sometimes, and thankfully it's not our church, but it sounds like church folks in other churches murmuring when they can't get what they want. They shouted when they could see the way and now they murmured when they can't see the way. They, they, they shouted when their prayers got answered but they pouted when their prayers didn't get answered. Bitter waters is when you find out your child is using drugs. Bitter waters is when you go through a divorce or you have sickness in your body that won't seem to let up on you or you have something that happens on the job and life becomes bitter. But what are you going to do when the bitter waters come? What are you going to do when you've shouted at one point and now you want to shout at somebody at another point? What do you do then? Will you, when you come to your bitter waters, will you spend time talking about being victimized by the water? That's what our world is today. Everybody blames somebody for something. I'd, I'd, I'd like to blame my parents on anything that ever happened to me that was bad. And that's what people do is usually go back, point to the parents, go back, point to the school teacher. Uh, I, everything that people talk about today, I had that in my life. And I thought that was part of what life was. I, I didn't know you were supposed to go on a talk show and tell people about it. I thought that's just part of it. I hope to be able to honor on our celebration of education my uh, uh, assistant principal from my high school, also my coach, Mr. Brazel. Uh, I, I would like for him to come and be able to honor him. I ha I'm going to contact him this week to see if he would come and let me uh, honor him. And, and when my cousin Cheryl Hill was alive, uh, he was in school with me. And, and so when Mr. Brazel would come on some of our special days, he, he would see me and Cheryl, and he, he was left-handed. He'd do like this. And I, I'd say, what are you doing? He said, well, my shoulder's still sore. I popped you guys so much. Now, today, you'd have to sue the school. You'd have to have some airhead parent up there talking to the news people about why you shouldn't have this kind of punishment. My mom and dad didn't know until we had an anniversary service, Mr. Brazel was here, that Mr. Brazel ever popped me in, and we're talking about with a board, in his, in his office. They, they never really knew that because I was smart enough not to tell my parents that. Because we were under, we were under this archaic idea uh, then, and we were living in the barbaric times uh, way before cars and air that, that uh, you know, if I would have gone home and said I had to go to the office today and, and I got five swats with the board, Oh, that ain't nothing. Now the real punishment begins. Oh, I, yeah, there, there wasn't any, what? He, I tell you, I'll go down there and I'll tear that, that school down block by block. Uh, my boy, somebody, you know, uh, they, my mom and dad knew me. Yes. I, I, I don't understand parents sometimes. It's like, well, I tell you what, I'm going to go down there because they're being mean to my kids. You know your little juvenile delinquent. You, you know what they do. You know they sass. You know they talk back. You know that they do those things. And, and, and the school's just doing their best to try to help that out. Now they can't, but back then they did that. But, but Mr. Brazel, listen, I didn't blame anything that happened in my life on what happened with Mr. Brazel. I felt like that's what moved me forward. For the moment it did toward his desk. But I'm talking about forward in my life. We spend time talking about being victimized by the water. or Are we going to complain that nobody has to drink bitter waters like we do? Are we going to criticize the leaders as if they made the waters and made it where, where it couldn't be consumed? 
Are we going to blame someone else on the condition of the water? Real, the real problem wasn't the water. It was what Israel was going to do after the praise stopped. How were they going to handle this seemingly set back in their existence? It's this sickness in the sanctuary that, that we have to deal with sometimes. It's, I, I'm convinced praisers don't complain. I'm convinced prayer room people don't murmur. I, I'm convinced super servers don't look for things to find fault with. They're too busy serving other people and they're involved in the work of God. God sent 10, thank you all seven of you. God sent 10 plagues and remember this, when he sent the 10 plagues to the Egyptians, 10 is the number of testing, which that's why he uses the 10th or the tithe. That's the number of testing. Some people connected with our church uh, have failed that test. But that's where the test is on the 10th. He sent 10 plagues to the Egyptians and once they got out and God brought them through, Praise started in and when praise was concluded and now they march into real life and the euphoric feeling of being in that excitement is gone, they meet the bitter waters. Let me tell you what will separate a good church from a great church is what you do in the lowest points of your life. What you do when everything is against you. <coughs> Are you saying yes when hell says no? That's what makes you a great church. God handled the bitter problem with a tree. It always happens that way. Calvary was the thing that brought sweetness uh, into bitter lives. But when you have praise, when you begin to praise God, it's almost like a, right in the middle of your dilemma. You say, well, I don't know how I'm going to get out. I don't really have anything to thank the Lord for. But you thank the Lord for what he has done. You thank the Lord because he hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't let you down. And all of a sudden, you put some of those things together, it becomes a cocktail of comfort. There's something that goes on. It's just there's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you mix that all together, and then praise breaks out right in the middle of the bitter moment, right in the middle of that discouraging time. Some of you come in, your chin's dragging on the ground. Today, I just had all these things happen. I've been really tired. Some of you got long faces. Your face so long you can eat popcorn out of a Coke bottle. And you got all these things going on in your life or eat corn through a picket fence, one of those things. You got those things going on in your life and just feel like I don't know it just seemed like last Sunday everything was going good and now everything's not going good I understand that but when that happens don't let your praise be subdued raise your hands anyway and say God it hadn't happened yet but I'm praising you until it does you are on the throne stand with me would you Woo. Pastor, that's good if, man, I wish I could do that. I ain't telling you anything I hadn't done. I'm telling you this stuff, I have to tell people things. They say, that's really hard, Pastor. I said, yeah, I know I've had to do it. You just got to go in there with your praise on. You just got to go in there thanking God. Well, that's being unrealistic. No, that's being more realistic than anything else because you know that God's going to come on the scene. He's come on the scene before. He hasn't, uh, he hasn't left you and abandoned you. He hasn't, he hasn't pushed you back somewhere. But today, when this ministry team is here and our altar workers and, and those that are a part of these ministries are here, this is your opportunity to move forward, to advance. When you advance, there will be bitter things. We always get prepared to go into next steps and, and we tell people, you want to join the church, you want to become a part, you want to, uh, you want to get baptized, you need the Holy Ghost, you want to be a part of the Bible study, you want to get involved in, in, in launch and, and, and learn the Word of God, you want, to, you want to move forward, you want to get connected to one of the groups, uh, then you go into to the North Lobby and uh, they'll help you get situated and, and move forward. But I can tell you, sometimes it's smooth sailing, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes that hell will come out to try to stop you from doing what you're going to do. 
And what you've got to do is while you're driving in your car and somebody said you're crazy, just raise your hands and just say, God, I may be crazy, but I'm going to praise you anyway. I'm not going to let anything happen after my praise. I'm going to keep on praising. I'm going to keep on loving. As a show, if you're in this building today and you, you, you have legs and you can walk up here, I'm not going to pray for you. I'm not going to shake you or anything. But we, we ought to have everybody uh, ought to feel like I can just, I, I'm going to come up here. I'm gonna, I, I, want you to, I want you to show the enemy. I can raise my hands and you can't stop me. Now, if you need the Holy Ghost, the ministry team's here to pray with you. You want somebody just to join with you? Come on up here and do that. Let's get up here real quick. We only have a few minutes. I know you're just about ready to go home. You're already thinking about what you're going to eat and all of that stuff. But don't worry about it. we got just a few seconds here. I want you to raise your hands and say, nothing's going to keep me down. I'm going to praise the Lord right now. I'm going to praise him with all my mind. I'm going to praise him with all my heart. 